fresh start doesn't always mean a fresh heart. For many people today, the Bible is merely a book of religious platitudes, virtue signals, morality stories, or spiritual sayings. But the Bible is the revelation of God about God. As the revealer of himself, the author and the finisher of our faith also reveals to us in the Bible human nature and the history of humankind. It's often said that the story of history is written by the victor. The side that wins determine what history is recorded. But God, who is before all things, who will still be after all things that we know conclude, is the one who best reveals history. He's best for the task because he determines and he defines history. History in scripture is a series of tests given by God to mankind. These tests are not how God gets to know what his creatures are like, like some scientist trying to figure out how an atom works or what attracts a male sparrow to a female sparrow. God created us. He knows who we are. He knows what we are. He knows why we are. His tests are not so he can figure out what makes us work. His tests are so we can understand what kind of a race we are, what we are even as individuals. And history, recorded by God in his word, shows us that we are a people unwilling and unable to meet God's standards. We're totally depraved sinners. And total depravity doesn't mean that you and I are as bad as we can be. Total depravity means that you and I are completely and fully consumed by sin. Our minds, sinful. Bodies, sinful. Our souls are sinful. Our thoughts are sinful. Our emotions, the things that we do, the words that we speak, sinful. As a creature, humankind is capable of the most horrible and horrifying offenses against one another and against our creator. Just this week in the newspaper, read the story of a woman who was working as a babysitter. She took a little two-month-old baby and she beat it to death, saying that she hated that little child that she was caring for. As bad as that is, as horrible as that is, she could have done even worse because she could have carried it out on other children. And my friend, whether you will admit it or not, you are capable of the very same things because you are totally depraved. Sin rules and reigns in our bodies, in our minds, on our tongues. Just try it. You don't believe me? Control your tongue for one week straight. Say nothing that's offensive to God or to anybody else. See. See if you can do it. And even if you could do it, you were probably thinking it. There are a lot of times where I'm thinking things that never come out of my mouth. You too, probably. History, though, is the record of man's failure in God's schoolroom. That history lesson begins in Eden in God's goodness and man's innocence. The next short step is man's failure to honor God. Even when God gave the world a fresh start and a fresh setting after the worldwide flood, we failed. A fresh start didn't mean a new heart. And until humanity and until individuals have a new God-given heart through a new birth, 
We continue to slide deeper into the abyss of separation from God until we hit bottom in the bottomless pit of God's just wrath against sin and sinner alike. Had God's only son not jumped into time and space through his birth and then divided the human condition by his death on the cross, you and I would be eternally damned. No one would ever see the face of God. We would not know his love and his grace, and we certainly wouldn't have the hope of an eternity with him. But because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, one future day, just as the Creator's world and the Creator's creature began in a literal, physical paradise in God's presence, His work of redemption is going to be fully experienced in and by His creation. There will not only be a fresh start for God's creation, but everyone in God's creation will have fresh hearts without sin or sin's stain. This world that began in physical, literal goodness is going to end in physical, literal goodness. The universe that today groans under the burden of sin is going to experience the full consummation of Christ's finished work at Calvary. Creation, the new heavens and the new earth, will once more literally and physically become the paradise of God in which God and man will dwell together in perfect and perpetual fellowship as God's people, in God's place, in God's presence. Our study in the book of Ezra tells us how after centuries of rebellious sin against God, Israel was cast into exile in Babylon and Assyria. God's people rejected God's rule and they became enslaved captives in foreign lands. And then after 70 years, God returned them to the land of his promise. And then he gave this remnant of his people a fresh start. But again, just as I began this message, is a fresh start enough to be effective? Israel, God's earthly people, built the second temple, what we call Zerubbabel's temple, and later was remodeled by King Herod and called Herod's temple. They rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They restored rightful worship of the God of gods. And how I wish we could end the story of Ezra right here today, right there, right now, with the conclusion, and they lived happily ever after. But that's true only in fairy tales. We'll begin to see this morning that the men and the women of the returned remnant failed the test. The final two chapters of Ezra's history of the remnant of Israel reveals the remnant's profound failure to measure up to God's standard, even after a fresh start in a fresh setting. But be assured, God's people and God's program never ultimately end in a flopping failure. God has assured us that he who is over and above history and history's actors will conclude with triumph and glory to the king of creation. Today, we're going to consider Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And the title of our message is, A Fresh Start. Follow along with me in your Bible as I read Ezra chapter 9 beginning with verse 1. When these things were done, the leaders came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, 
so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and the rulers has been foremost in this trespass. We've reached now the two-chapter conclusion of Ezra's book. And if you've enjoyed the teaching thus far in this book, you've been challenged by what this man had to say and what he did, you're going to find the end of this book even more interesting. What we read in chapters 9 and 10 of Ezra are going to challenge some of your ideas and your common perceptions even more than what you've been challenged already. Verse number one in our text this morning begins with another time stamp, another date on the calendar. Ezra writes, when these things were done. Now on its own, this doesn't seem to give us much of a clue for pinning a date on the calendar, but it actually does. Ezra chapter seven, verse nine says that Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Chapter 10 Verse 9 describes an event that occurred on the 20th day of the ninth month. So the events that we're reading of here in chapters 9 and 10 took place within a four-month period of time in the year 458 BC. Recall, Ezra was commissioned by King Artaxerxes of Persia to go to Jerusalem and find out if the remnant there knew the law of God, were practicing the law of God, and then Ezra was to teach the law of God and enforce the law of God by all means necessary. Chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Ezra's work teaching the word unveiled the light of God's glory to his people, but it also revealed the darkness of man's sin. Light has this profound way of showing us what's hidden by darkness. It's also very revealing of the things that we can't see or the things that we don't want to see. What had Ezra done in those four months to uncover this gross web of sin? All he had done was he taught the word of God. Now, the elders of the people reported news that Ezra didn't want to hear. Some of the men, including the priests and the Levites, were not living separated or holy lives. Remember, the word holy doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean perfect. The word holy means that God has taken something and dedicated it to his own purpose, to his own service. Israel wasn't holy because they were better as a nation than some other country or people. They were holy because the God who called them to himself is holy. And Israel was to live a life different because their relationship with God was different from the people around them, from the Samaritans. Those who were responsible in Israel for conducting godly worship were compromised. The leaders who were to rebuke sin engaged in sin and tolerated it. They'd come under the influence of the Samaritans and they were practicing syncretic paganism. That's a big term, big words. Syncretism simply means taking two different things, two separate things, and combining them into one setting two watches to the exact same time is syncretism. We are syncing our clocks. Mixing flour and water is syncretism. And syncretism takes place in politics and philosophy, even in religion. The Samaritans were the offspring of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. Assyrians, and Babylonians invaded a land. They would take captives from the best of the people. They would slaughter most of the rest, but they would leave behind the sick and the poor and the uneducated, the deplorables, if you will. 
They did this in Israel. They took the princes, they took the wealthy, they slaughtered most of the population and left the sick and the poor and uneducated behind while they took the best with them back to Assyria or back to Babylon. Conquered people then from other nations flowed into that vacuum that was left. They would be able to take over businesses and farms and homes that had been suddenly abandoned. Plus, the Assyrians and Babylonians would take people from other parts of the world and pump them into the new vacant area. So conquered people from other nations settled in Israel. Jews and Judaism were mingled with other religions and other peoples from around the Middle East. And the offspring of this were what we call and what the New Testament defines as Samaritans. The Samaritans, we read in verse number one, were guilty of abominations. That word refers to practices and beliefs, attitudes and lifestyles that God hates. Psalm 106 verses 34 through 39 describes these abominations, but from an earlier time in Israel's history, from the time of Joshua and the judges. Let me read to you Psalm 106 verses 34 through 39. They did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Verse 39, thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. The remnant in Ezra's day was living just like the Samaritans among them, beginning with idolatry. They were living as Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 describes, walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the path of sinners, sitting in the seat of the scornful, rather than walking in the truth to Ezra's delight. Interestingly, the leaders who approached Ezra recited a list of offending peoples, just like the list that Moses warned the children of Israel about before they entered Canaan land. God commanded, recall, Israel was to destroy the Canaanites, and yet Joshua and the judges failed to do that. The specific offense that is outlined for us here in Ezra was that the priests and the Levites were marrying pagan wives. They were violating the command of God in Exodus 34, verses 11 to 16, and Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. They demonstrated what verse 2 calls, in our text, a trespass. The word trespass literally means unfaithfulness. The sin of the people, the sin of the remnant, specifically of the priests and the Levites, was an unfaithfulness to God. There had been a breach of trust in their relationship with God. So 800 years after Joshua and the judges, the remnant was acting just like their ancestors at the time of the judges. They were breeding a new generation of spiritual bastards in the land. God's command, though, against marrying non-Jews wasn't about somebody's skin color or even about their nationality. God never forbid a Jew from marrying a non-Jew. Never. The Jewish man Salmon he married the former harlot from Jericho named Rahab in Ruth chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. Boaz married Ruth. She was a Moabitess. Esther was married to a Persian king. 
So the problem wasn't a Gentile spouse or based on skin color. The problem was a spouse who didn't worship Jehovah. A spouse who didn't worship Jehovah would encourage the Jewish spouse to be led away from Jehovah. Just as Solomon's many wives did to him in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 4. See, the prohibition about what we would call intermarriage was about God protecting his covenant people, his family of faith, from paganism. Not only did he tell them they were to be protected by killing all of the Canaanites, but they were not to intermarry with them or anybody else. They were to keep the household of faith, the family of faith, his covenant people, free from paganism. He didn't want to share his people with anyone. We face a danger in our own day of what I've always called missionary dating or missionary marriage. That's the idea that we date someone or we marry someone who's a non-believer and we have in the back of our mind or even in the front of our minds the intention of winning that person to Jesus by our love and by our example. It's one of those ideas that sounds oh so very reasonable. I, as a believer, will date an unbeliever and I'll win them to Jesus. I, as a believer, will marry an unbeliever and win them to Jesus by my loving example. Sounds good, except that God condemns it. God condemns it in places like 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. I've lost relationships with family, friends, and church members over the decades for insisting what God demands in this area, that a believer only marries another believer. Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, is considered one of America's most celebrated authors. His works are known universally and he stands as one of the most quoted individuals in all of the world. Very few people, however, know the story about his marriage. Two years after rising to prominence, after a story about a man who bet money on a frog jumping contest, Samuel met a man by the name of Charles Langdon. During the conversation with Langdon initially, Langdon showed a photograph of his sister Olivia. And the moment that Samuel Clemens saw that picture of Olivia, he declared his love for her. It was love for him at first sight. And he visited the Langdon home, met Olivia in person, and then asked her to marry him. Olivia rejected his out of the blue first time meeting proposal. And instead, she took up the task of converting him to Jesus. Over a period of 17 months, Samuel and Olivia wrote nearly 200 letters back and forth to one another. Samuel's letters gushed with romance. Olivia replied with copies of sermons or her beliefs about Christianity. Olivia and her parents had very serious reservations about Clemens who tried living a Christian life in order to impress the Langdons, but his reputation as a wild, godless drunk prevailed. Christianity is an inward reality before it becomes an outward lifestyle. Clemens tried living the Christian life without the heart reality. While he was pursuing Olivia, Clemens warned that when they married, she was going to abandon her faith. Four years after meeting, Olivia and Samuel married, remaining devoted to one another until she died in 1904. Samuel Clemens, though, never liked Christianity. In fact, he wrote this, quote, There is one notable thing about our Christianity, bad, bloody, merciless, money-grabbing, and predatory. Ours is a terrible religion." End quote. 
He called it, quote, a slaughterhouse religion because of the biblical doctrine of Jesus dying to save sinners from the wrath of God. Clemens rejected the Bible as God's revelation of himself. He rejected the existence of heaven or a hell. He denied the immortality of the soul and the deity of Jesus. He also had a profound dislike of Christians because they didn't live by what they believed. Again, quoting something he wrote. If Christ were here, there is one thing he would not be, a Christian, end quote. Upon financial ruin and the death of their young daughter, Samuel tried to console Olivia. He urged her to, quote, lean on your faith. She answered him, however, I cannot. I do not have any faith left. You and I would do very well to remember God's warning about marrying unbelievers. Deuteronomy chapter number seven, verses three and four. Israel was told, do not make marriages with them, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. See, it's nothing about skin color or eye color or what country you're from. It has to do with being devoted to God and God alone. One of the reasons God ordained marriage in the first place was the creation of what Ezra calls in the text, holy seed, or literally the term means separated offspring. What is holy seed? Let me provide to you two examples. The first is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After Adam and Eve sinned in Eden, God cursed creation. In pronouncing his curse upon the serpent, God said to him, and this is very curious to me that God would say this to Satan, not to Adam and Eve. He says to the serpent, and I will put enmity, a violent hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you will bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband. The text literally reads, your desire shall be to be over your husband, to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. Remember that the Bible was written without chapter divisions. So let's keep reading Genesis. Immediately after cursing creation and exiling the first couple out of Eden, we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, these words. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from Jehovah, from the Lord. Now Eve was taking that promise in Genesis 3.15. She understood God's promise of a seed to be fulfilled in her son Cain. But when Cain killed Abel, that notion was set aside. And then we read chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. Here's the reason she called him this. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Adam and Eve were told in Genesis 5 verse 4 had many sons and many daughters. Imagine for just a moment how many children you might have if you lived 900 years. But Cain and Seth represent in the book of Genesis two distinct lineages or two families in human history in the Bible. Seth's family, if you follow the genealogies, is godly. And from Seth comes the Jewish people. 
Cain's family, however, is symbolic of unregenerate, God-hating humanity. Cain and Seth were what, in theology, we would call a near fulfillment of God's promise. That means that when God made the promise in Genesis 3.15, there was, in time, a nearby fulfillment of that promise of a seed. But the promise in Genesis 3.15 of a skull-crushing, conquering Savior was not fulfilled in Seth, at least not fully. It was ultimately and finally fulfilled in a far distant time in the person of Jesus, who in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8, we read, he came to die and destroy Satan and Satan's works. Seth fulfilled that prophecy partially in the nearness of the promise, but it was fully fulfilled in the person of Jesus far off in time. Now this near and far fulfillment of Bible prophecy is found throughout the Old and New Testaments. But when it comes to the idea of a holy seed, I think it's even more clear in the story of Abraham than maybe it is in Cain and Seth. Abraham was promised by God a seed that would come from his marriage to Sarah. And you know the story. They got impatient because God wasn't working on their timetable. So Sarah suggests Abraham, take my slave girl, get her pregnant, and that will be the seed that God promised. Well, God doesn't work that way. We find in Scripture, God's promise was that Sarah would give Abraham a son. And that seed, that son, was a boy named Isaac. You'll find in the following passages that I'm going to give you the fact that not only was Isaac that son, but Isaac fulfilled the promise of being God's promised seed. Genesis 13, verses 14 through 16. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 17, 1 through 9, and then verses 15 through 21. Genesis 18, verses 9 through 15. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 3. Isaac was the near fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. But it was an incomplete fulfillment because God was using Isaac's fulfillment of that seed promise as a picture of, as a symbol, if you will, to the far fulfillment that would come in the person of Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, Paul wrote that Jesus is that far fulfillment, that ultimate fulfillment, that complete fulfillment of the promise of a seed God gave to Abraham. In the law of Moses, God demanded that his earthly chosen people remain separate from the world around them, by keeping marriage only within the family of faith. This command was in part because God wanted to preserve godly worship in his earthly people, and he wanted to preserve the godly line that Jesus would eventually be born for, from. Read through the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, and you see the preservation of a godly line, even though Solomon married a Gentile harlot, even though Boaz married a Gentile woman named Ruth, they were godly people. It didn't mean that they couldn't marry as Jews someone from another country like an Egyptian like Moses did. The command really was about faith. It was about following God faithfully. God said through the prophet Malachi. In Malachi chapter 2, verse number 15, that he gave marriage because he desired godly offspring in Israel. Just like God does of believers today in 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Now I need to add a word of caution at this point, I think. The Bible never suggests that when two believers marry and they have children, that their offspring are going to be saved. 
That's the idea that if Christians just had enough babies, eventually the whole world would become Christian. That's nonsense. The Bible is filled with examples of just the opposite taking place. Godly parents producing ungodly children. That foolish idea also suggests that salvation is genetic. Salvation, you being a child of God, is passed down through sexual intercourse rather than through God's grace, through believing faith in Christ Jesus. If we just have children, they'll automatically become Christians. Because you and I have sex and you give birth, that baby is going to be a Christian. That removes the idea of God's grace and believing faith as the responsibility in that child. But two believing parents are in a position to teach their children the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.15, the scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Just because you teach the Bible to your kids doesn't mean they're going to be saved. But the promise is teaching them the Bible will make them wise for salvation. And the salvation comes through personal faith in Christ Jesus. Not because you baptized them. Not because they memorized Bible verses. Not because you took them to Sunday school every week. Not because you were a Christian and you prayed before every meal. Those things can make them wise for salvation. But salvation comes only by God's grace through personal faith in Christ Jesus. And parents, you are responsible to making them wise through teaching them the Bible. So two believing parents are better able to teach scripture to their children, but they're also best as models to their offspring. Two believing parents are the biblical example not only of a living, thriving, active Christianity, of a personal faith in Christ, but also of Christ's relationship to his church. Again, a caution. This doesn't mean that a single believing parent can't teach a child the Bible or model genuine Christian faith. Timothy's mother was a believer while her husband was either dead or was unbelieving. And frankly, what's the difference between a single parent who has lost their spouse through death or through divorce? They, that woman or that man is still a single parent. And that single parent can teach scripture and model Christian faith. But we don't aim for that. Timothy's mother was a believer while her husband was either dead or unbelieving. And she had the assistance of her mother who helped to raise Timothy in a godly fashion by teaching him the scripture. Raising godly children is just easier with two believing parents. And only in a Christian marriage can the relationship between Christ and his church really be modeled. The prophet Malachi, who was a contemporary of Nehemiah, he preached about 13 years after Ezra arrived in Jerusalem. He noted in his book, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, that priests were divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry younger women who were outside of God's covenant people. They were doing the same thing that Ezra is confronted by here in Ezra chapter 9. The problem that Ezra is confronted with is back in vogue a decade later. You've heard me say it a thousand times over. Context is king in understanding communication. Context just means that you understand communication, verbal, written, or visual, based on what comes before it and what comes after it. Without the context, you can make something say anything that you want. Your wildest dreams can come true just on that little thing rather than what's around it that gives it its context, that gives it its meaning. 
a famous preacher who is now a United States Senator, performed a memorial service for another politician who died in the year 2020. In his sermon, this pastor quoted Isaiah chapter 53, verse number five, and he applied it directly to the dead man from Congress. He spoke about that man's political philosophy, that man's political life, and that man's political works. He said this verse was about that politician. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Raphael Warnock, a preacher, now a United States senator, said Isaiah 53.5 was written about a dead congressman. And Christians were rightly offended by this preacher of a false gospel, and we accused him publicly and in private of blasphemy against the God that he claimed to believe in and preach about. For 2,000 years, we have always and only understood Isaiah 53 to be about the suffering and the death of Jesus to save sinners from eternal damnation through his death on the cross. Senator Warnock ignored the historical, grammatical context, and he twisted the scripture, applying it so it no longer meant what Isaiah meant, or what the Holy Spirit intended, or what the church has always held that it is believed. Because that's what it is written, and what it is defined by in its context, and its application in the New Testament. For more than 40 years, I've taught classes on how to understand the Bible. I've preached it from this very pulpit I'm at today. It's called the science of hermeneutics. It's called a science because there are careful methods of discovery involved. And hermeneutics just simply means understanding communication. How do you understand communication? And I always begin by explaining that to understand the Bible, there are two questions we have to think about, we have to answer. The first question is, when the author or the speaker communicated, what was the author's intent and what was his purpose when he wrote or said these words? To understand what the author said or what was written, you'll need to study about the author. You'll need to study and learn about the people that he wrote to or wrote about. You'll need to know the historical setting. You'll need to know the thoughts before what he wrote or said and the thoughts after what he wrote or said because they'll help to define what you're looking at. And that's what we call the context. After we understand the context, then we can ask the second question. How does this statement affect me? What am I supposed to do with what I've just read or what I've just heard? Only after we understand the context, the interpretation, then we go to what is called the application. What do we do with it? Interpretation is about the meaning. Application is about the me. Let me say that again. Interpretation is about the me-ning. Application is about the me. And without careful interpretation, application is always going to be faulty. When I was a child growing up, there was a popular television show about two single women living in an apartment with a single man. And almost every episode of that TV series was about somebody overhearing one or two phrases of a conversation and jumping to wild conclusions about it. That's what happens when we don't consider the context. 
if Jack had been at the door listening to the entire congregation between Janet and Chrissy, there would have been no TV show because there would have been nothing crazy that happened. But because he walked over and listened to just three or four little words, he could take those three or four little words and explode into a 30-minute hijinks. That's what we do with the Bible sometimes. We take one little sentence, one little phrase, one little verse, and we make it into something that God never intended and that the author didn't mean. Context is essential, not only for understanding all conversation and communication, but especially that which has been breathed out in Holy Scripture by God. You and I want to do everything possible to keep from distorting and twisting and manipulating God's words to satisfy our own ideas. I'm going to ask you now to turn from Ezra to the end of your Old Testament, to the book of Malachi. And I want us to read together the context of what we've just been talking about, about the priests and the Levites divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry women who followed other gods. And in the process of divorcing their wives, they were abandoning and leaving their children. Malachi, chapter number 2, verses 11 through 16. Consider the context. Judah has dealt treacherously. Let me pause for one other second here. Malachi is writing his book about all the sins, not only by deed, but sins of word and sins of intent in the priests and the Levites. So he's specifically speaking about priests and Levites, but he takes all of the remnant into this conversation. Okay, Malachi chapter 2, starting with verse 11. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of of a foreign God. Israel, Israel had defiled the holy institution of marriage, not because they married, not because the Jew married somebody from Egypt, not because a light-skinned man married a dark-skinned woman. It's about marriage outside of the faith. They married daughters of foreign gods. Verse number 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, and yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts? And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with crying. So he doesn't regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. And yet you say, for what reason? Why isn't God listening to us as the priests and the Levites, as the people, just because we've divorced our wives, abandoned our children, so that we can marry women who worship other gods? Why would God abandon us? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she's your companion. She's your wife by covenant. But did he, did God not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why did God make them one? He seeks godly offspring, a holy seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, and here's why. It covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. We're going to talk about this passage here in Malachi in a further time, 
But the sin here, the reason God says he hates divorce is that these Jewish men of faith were abandoning their Jewish wives and their Jewish children so they could marry younger pagans. And God says he hates that because marriage is to be a relationship in the family of faith. It was sin for a man in God's covenant family to marry a heathen woman. It created the very real potential of her leading the man into abandoning God, just like Eve led Adam into disobeying God in Eden. Such a marriage meant that the unbelieving wife would raise their children in the new marriage in paganism. The quotation is that's so famous, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And you and I both know that in most households, it's the wife who raises the children. She's the one who disciplines. She's the one who educates. She's the one who leads them from infancy to adulthood. And that shouldn't be so, but that's the way it works out. And the wife is almost always the one who leads in spiritual things in a family. So a man who marries an unbelieving woman, she is naturally going to raise her children in her paganism. If this was so bad, just an, a Jewish man marrying a non-believing woman, forget the previous relationship, the previous marriage, forget existing children. A believing Jew marrying a unbelieving Gentile. If that was so bad, consider how much worse it is when the believing man divorced his Jewish wife and abandoned his children along the side of the road for the purpose of marrying a heathen woman. Hold on to your seats because that's exactly what the remnant was doing in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. And that is why God said he hated divorce. The priests and the Levites were bringing, what is it that he writes in Malachi 2.15? The divorced wife who was left without a husband provider, she suffered treacherously. Remember the culture of the day. Women could not go out and get a job in a business somewhere. She couldn't generally start a business. Women were uneducated. Women couldn't go out and begin a business and start a business. They relied 100% upon their husbands to provide for them. And without a husband provider, she would suffer violence at the hands of others. Their children were left without a father provider as well. So this sin of a believing husband father divorcing his believing wife so he could marry a younger heathen, covered the father's garments with violence figuratively, and consider the violence that his abandoned wife and his abandoned children would suffer. Look at the plague, the scourge of this in America today. Instead of calling someone my father, this is my child's mother. We call them baby mamas because there's no relationship between the man and the woman except for the child. He's my baby daddy. And you know, there's no shame today in that term. And I, I venture to say it's not just in America. It happens all over. You pick a culture, you pick a country, it's happening there. And it didn't just transport there magically from America because of the TV set or because of missionaries. It was there before. What we're reading about in Ezra, what we'll read about in Nehemiah, what we find in the book of Malachi didn't come from America. It didn't come from the West. It came from the human heart, which is deceitful and wicked above all things. Stop blaming other people for your sins. Take responsibility. Repent of your sins.
get right with God. Marriage, Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers, is more than companionship in fulfilling God's purposes for you from Genesis 2, 18 through 25, or sexual pleasure that you read about in the Song of Solomon. Marriage is more than about reproduction, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Marriage is more than simply producing godly offspring. In Ephesians 5, Paul gave practical black and white examples of what being filled with the Spirit looks like. And if you read through Ephesians chapter 5, he never once mentions speaking in tongues, rolling on the floor, decreeing and declaring wealth and health. That has nothing to do with being Spirit-filled. Paul wrote about what Spirit-filled living looks like. Believers need to live in the light of Scripture's revelation, Ephesians 5, 13 through 17. And they are to avoid influences that can divert us from God's path. That's Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And then Paul gives a series of examples of submission. That is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. That's the result of being Spirit-filled is submission. He mentions first, wives are to willingly submit to their husband's authority. He mentions that children are to submit to their parents' authority by obeying their parents and the Lord. Fathers are to submit to God by disciplining their children in a loving manner with an eye toward Christ's likeness. He then goes on and he says that slaves are to obey their masters. They're to submit to their masters just as they submit to the Lord. And masters are to treat their slaves in the same way that Christ treats them. In the middle of that, Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, we have how husbands are to submit. Husbands are to love their wives. Understanding that marriage reflects Christ's covenant relationship to his church, which he bled and died to save, and now he lives for. A husband submits to God and shows that submission as a spirit-filled husband by loving his wife as Christ loves the church. Marriage is to be a reflection of the relationship of Jesus to you and to me. Fix in your mind the scene both Ezra and later Nehemiah both confronted and Malachi wrote about. The priests and the Levites who were to be examples of holiness in Israel and to the whole world, these men who were teachers of God's word and mediators between God and man, were divorcing their Hebrew wives, abandoning their Hebrew children so they could marry younger, unbelieving, pagan Samaritans. That is the context of Ezra chapter 9 and 10. That's the context that we'll see in Nehemiah. That is the context of Malachi where God says he hates divorce. Do you understand why I began this message today saying I wish Ezra had stopped writing at the end of chapter 8? And now you and I are left to wonder what Ezra did. How did the remnant respond? And what we're going to discover in chapters 9 and 10 is going to be shocking to many of those who have never read or ever studied the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. I don't want to jump ahead of myself, though. So let's end today with a teaser to whet your appetite as to how Ezra responded to this news of sin from Israel's elders. Is there going to be another fresh start after the remnant's failure? Is God going to give the remnant a fresh heart or just a fresh setting? Verse number three of our text in Ezra chapter nine. 
So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and my beard. And I sat down, astonished. Next time, as the Lord permits, we're going to begin looking at Ezra's response to the remnant's sin. God bless you. And please, read ahead in your Bible so that the Holy Spirit can be working in you as we read and study his word together.